seminar on EU defence policy with perspectives from the Netherlands and Sweden. It's great to see uh, that we have a full room today and also that many people are uh, watching the seminar online via our YouTube channel. My name is Karina Borsvensson and I work as Chief of Staff at Folkofesvar and I will be moderating uh, our seminar today. As I'm sure you know, the large-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine has dramatically challenged the European security order and its foundational principles. This has led to major shifts for many European countries' uh, defence and security policies. One such example is, of course, that Sweden and Finland are currently in the ratification process to join NATO. Most uh, EU countries are increasing their defence spending, and both EU and NATO are continuing their support to Ukraine. The Netherlands is a member of both the EU and NATO, and in the coming years, the Netherlands will meet the NATO standard of spending 2% of GDP on def def defence. The Ministry of Defence has highlighted the importance of contributing to European security with a strong transatlantic cooperation, as well as more European cooperation on defence and security. The EU's new strategic compass offers many starting points to expand and uh, intensify European cooperation. Currently, the focus is on how the EU is providing military support to Ukraine, both through funding, um, European peace facility, and training uh, through the Euro uh, EU military assistance mission. But this has also sparked discussions on how the EU can do more in providing Ukraine with ammunition and to scale up uh, the production capacity uh, of the European defence industry. Our seminar today will highlight perspectives from the Netherlands and Sweden on the, the future for the EU defence and security policy. We hope to shed light on what some of the most priori prioritised uh, courses of action are in order to strengthen the EU cooperation as well as how the EU and NATO can develop Euro European security together. We hope to hear from our speakers whether uh, Sweden and the Netherlands have shared the same challenges uh, when it comes to defence cap cap uh, capabilities and if there are lessons uh, that the countries can learn uh, from uh, each other. We are delighted to present uh, you uh, four very knowledgeable speakers tonight and we're very honoured to have two ministers uh, with, with us. We have Kaisa Olongren, Minister of Defence of the Netherlands and Paul Jonsson, Minister of Defence of Sweden. Uh, we're also glad to have uh, our uh, expert commentators, Anna Wislande, Director of Northern Europe of the Atlantic Council, and Björn Fegestin, a Senior Researcher at uh, the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and CEO of Politea. Just a couple of words on the programme before we start. Uh, we will start with uh, Minister Ollongren, followed by Minister Jonsson. Then they will both be invited uh, to the stage for a Q&A session. Here we welcome questions from the audience, so please signal to me if you wish to ask either one or both ministers a question. Um, then we will invite our expert commentators Anna Wislander and Björn Fagestin to share their reflections with us and discuss further. There will also be opportunities to include questions from the audience uh, here. Without further ado, we will begin our seminar with remarks by Kaisa Ollongren, Minister of Defence of the Netherlands. Please, Mr. Ollongren, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Tak, uh, Karin. It's good to be here in Stockholm, and I really want to thank you uh, and uh, Volker Fersvar for organizing this uh, event on this special day when uh, Paul, uh, my colleague, is hosting mm. uh, all his European defence ministers for our informal uh, meeting that will start uh, tonight. Um, but I think it's important to also have uh, an opportunity to discuss the situation that we are in with uh, a more ad academic uh, audience in, in a think tank setting. So thank you for arranging that for us. Uh, and actually, um, this morning, I didn't start my day in Stockholm and also not in, in The Hague, but I started my day in Ernst Hulsvik. Uh, and uh, I would say that many people in the Netherlands don't know Ernst Hulsvik. And if they know it, <laughs> they will probably think of Fjellreven, which is uh, uh, something that uh, outdoor people like very much. Uh, but that was also not the reason for my visit. The reason for my visit was to go to Heglund. And Heglund, of course, produces the CV-90s, among other things. Uh, and um, this combat vehicle uh, has been used by our army for, for quite some time. And they are currently being upgraded. It's a very important upgrade to increase its uh, armor and, and, and firepower. And it's also a big order. It's worth almost 800 million euros. 
uh, and, and that's why I went there. And um, to have, you know, high quality and effective capacity is extremely important. And I think uh, people also realize, realize now how important it is. It's becoming more relevant uh, in view of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. So I wanted to go there to talk to the company and to hear uh, from them how they respond to the new security situation uh, and how uh, companies in general can adapt to the increasing demand that we are seeing. And that is an issue that I would like to come back to later on. Um, but so the, the reason to be here today is the Swedish EU presidency, uh, to have the informal meeting of the defense ministers uh, that uh, Paul is hosting uh, tonight and tomorrow. <coughs> Uh, and I think that one of my main messages will be that the Netherlands fully support the priorities of the Swedish presidency uh, on security and defense. And I think that we all agree that we have one top priority, which is Ukraine. It is their fight against <coughs> the imperialist ambitions of Putin uh, that we have to support because the promise of a free and democratic society is at stake in this war. And just a few weeks ago, ago we commemorated that uh, we have already one year of this horrific Russian invasion. Uh, and I think we all admire, because we, we admire the Ukrainians, we see their strength, we see their bravery of the normal Ukrainian people, and of course also of their armed forces and their political leadership. It is extremely important. Uh, it's also important that we continue to see the immense suffering of the Ukrainian people, uh, that we continue to feel this deep frustration about this senseless and illegal war. And I think uh, after more than one year, we can at least draw one conclusion, and that is that Putin has failed. He failed in what he thought would be a quick conquest of Ukraine. He underestimated the Ukrainians. Uh, he underestimated the unity, the unity within the European Union, the <coughs> unity within NATO and really a deep, deep resolve that we feel in our countries, in Sweden and Netherlands, but also many more countries, our resolve to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Um, and we have done a lot. I don't think this works anymore. I hope it's OK anyway. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but it's still working in, uh, in the camera. I was working in the camera. OK, <laughs> then I, I hope you still hear me. Um, now, we have done a lot. Uh, I, I think. Uh, our support is crucial, and President Zelensky and also our colleague uh, Oleksiy Reznikov, they say it every time, our, su crucial, our support is crucial to repel the Russians. Um, and there I really want to compliment Paul, but also your government, because you have really made a difference. Your military aid packages to Ukraine are remarkable. They now also include the Leopard 2s, uh, the Hawk Air defense systems, of course also the CV-90s. That is going to make a difference to have you know substantive uh, and impressive packages of weapon systems that is what we can do uh, to help ukraine and that is what they need the most right now we have also done that in the netherlands L last year uh, we have donated military equipment uh, to an amount of a value of about one uh, billion euros uh, including uh, together with the americans and the germans patriot missile system panzer howitzers uh, stinger missiles air defense armored vehicles uh, uh, amongst others. And for this year we've pledged 2.5 billion euros to support Ukraine. Uh, we form coalitions, for instance, with Germany and Denmark to buy and modernize more than 100 Leopard 1 tanks, the older uh, Leopard 1, uh, also with Ukraine as a destination. So I would say that here we have two countries, Sweden and the Netherlands, that are really forward-leaning uh, in supporting Ukraine uh, and forward leading also in telling uh, everybody that we need to keep this up, to keep the support up to help Ukraine win this war. <coughs> I want to mention uh, one item that I feel very strongly about myself and that is accountability. Because uh, we know that war crimes are being <coughs> committed against humanity, uh, crimes of aggression against women and children. And they need to be prosecuted, so we need to collect evidence now, uh, as much as we can. Ukraine has uh, asked for help of the Netherlands, uh, and other European countries ha have done uh, the same. We have had a forensic team there twice. We will send back a forensic team again to collect this evidence. Uh, and I really encourage more countries to do the same under the coordination of the ICC, 
uh, with experts uh, and everything uh, uh, that they need. We need to do this to make sure that those responsible will be held accountable after this war. Uh, I also think that the EU has shown that it has real added value. Uh, it has taken unprecedented steps uh, and we have shown unprecedented uh, uh, unity. Uh, for instance, by using the European Peace Facility to allow speedy delivery uh, of uh, weapons by member states. Uh, and it's about a lot of money. 2.6 billion euros has already been committed to this end. Uh, we have set up a major uh, military training program for, for the Ukrainian's military with, with headquarters in Poland and uh, Germany. Uh, we aim to train more than 30,000 soldiers this year. And I think uh, this is what we have to continue to do. Now, a couple of weeks ago, there was an initiative by the uh, Estonian Prime Minister. Uh, she put forward a proposal for the EU to jointly procure ammunition, uh, especially 155 uh, caliber ammunition for Ukraine. And tomorrow we will discuss the proposals by Josep Borrell, the High Representative. Uh, he has worked out a number of options. Uh, I applaud it because we need to move fast. Uh, we, knew we need to deliver to, to Ukraine and we need to show that we've also learned the lessons of the past year, that time is of the essence uh, and that to procure ammunition on a large scale and to, to deliver on Ukraine uh, is crucial in the face of the, uh, the ongoing war this spring. Which brings me to what perhaps is our most important message, I think, tomorrow also. That is that we need to ramp up production capacity of the European defense industry. So the demand for weapons and ammunition has, is, is sky high. We know that uh, because we need to replenish our stocks because they are getting too empty. Uh, we need to continue and to increase our deliveries to Ukraine. So the supply side has to gear up as well. Uh, and that means that we, while rising our defense budgets, uh, we also need to give them long-term security. Uh, that is what, these, what the industry uh, needs. And if they get that long-term security, then we can expect from industry to do their part, which is to ramp up uh, their uh, production. And also there, I think the EU pay, could play a very uh, positive role. And while we're all doing this, we have to uh, address another issue, which is fragmentation. And we've known that for a long time. Uh, but fragmentation is uh, really a problem, and you see it in our aid to Ukraine. We are sort of exporting our own fragmentation to Ukraine and they have to deal with it. Um, and uh, I think this is a good time to break through existing barriers that we known have been there for a long time, also on the European defense market. And only an integrated open market can also compete on the global scale. So it is also in our best interest to do so. Uh, and I hope that um, uh, uh, Commissioner Breton, who has already put forward some proposals, will continue to do that and stimulate more cooperation within Europe, with the European Defence Fund and soon also with DIRPA, uh, which is a new instrument to, uh, to uh, stimulate joint uh, procurement. Uh, and I really hope under the Swedish presidency that we will find an agreement with the European Parliament on this issue. Um, and let me end uh, by saying that uh, we fully support uh, the Swedish and Finnish application for <coughs> NATO membership. And I really hope uh, that soon you will not only be invitees, but that both Sweden and Finland at the same time uh, will be actual members. Because I know for sure that NATO is our best insurance for, uh, for, for the safety of, of our countries in Europe. Um, and it will enhance uh, the security for NATO and also for Finland and Sweden. Um, so, so we are all aware of the fact that still two allies have to ratify, but we stand ready to support Sweden and Finland in any way we can. So that's uh, what I would like to say to you as opening remarks. Uh, let me conclude by saying that let's never get used to this war. Uh, it's been more than one year, but we have to keep saying to people that uh, it is a war that should never have happened, that Russia cannot win, and that's why we must continue our support to Ukraine. Thank you very much. Um, I have so many follow-up questions, but I think I'll save them for our discussion later. And uh, without uh, further ado, I think I'd like to uh, invite uh, Minister Paul Jonsson to give his remarks um, as well. And then I'll uh, invite you back uh, on stage, both of you. 
Thank you very much, Karim, for, for, for the kind invitation. Kajsa, thank you much for, for arranging this seminar and for most of all for coming to Stockholm at a crucial time at our informal defense ministers' meetings. It's, um, it's a big day. It was also a big day to go out to greet Mr. Resnikov. He came to Arlanda this uh, morning and uh, to go and visit uh, wounded soldiers and uh, also first time I saw him since Mikolaev. So, very important day for us. Now, what about the Swedish presidency? Let me also say how much I appreciate our cooperation, uh, guys, and thank you all the efforts that you're doing for, for Ukraine. I think we have a unity of purpose. I very much appreciate the cooperation between Sweden and the Netherlands for many reasons. I think we're quite like-minded, both because we're Atlanticist, because we believe the world becomes a better place when Europe and the United States and Canada cooperates, uh, but also because sometimes we can be Europeanist, because we also think it's natural that the EU also takes a larger responsibility for security. It's about time that the Europe also step up to, to some of the challenges they were exposed to. Secondly, uh, we meet in a lot of forums, and that's great. Uh, we meet at a lot of conference tables. We meet at the Joint Expeditionary Force, we meet at the Framework Nation, we meet at uh, EU, we meet at NATO, and we meet at EI2. And so that creates many avenues for, for us to cooperate. Nothing is good. At those conference tables, our interventions are not always the longest or not, not even the most elegant. But I think a unity of purpose that Sweden and Netherlands are that we are doers and that we focus on deliverables. And, and I feel that connection. I think it's very important also in our very similar approach to, to uh, European defense and European defense cooperation. Now, I have a little bit of a longer speech, but I will not hold it because I, unfortunately I have to leave in, uh, in about 15 minutes because I'm going to greet uh, our uh, other 26 colleagues here. So I'll, I'll cut it a little bit short, but I, I'll tell you some of the core messages that we have for the Swedish EU presidency. And one thing that I've been trying to say over and over again you know, about the Swedish presidency is that we no longer see any kind of contradiction between a stronger EU and a stronger NATO. Sweden intends to be fully engaged into both the EU and NATO. I don't want Sweden to be at the fringes of the CSDP. I want it to be at the heart. And I think when we become full part of NATO, we can actually play a more, much more decisive and effective role also in European defense matters. I, I think that's a key to take away from, uh, from the Swedish uh, government and our position that uh, there's no zero sum game. The NATO membership will also be helpful for us to play our full role in European defense matters. As a sign of increasing Swedish engagement, I'm also happy that the fifth wave of the PESCO project that's coming up in May, that we're stepping up our activities considerably. I think that's very, very good. Secondly, Sweden welcomes deeper co and uh, more effective EU-NATO cooperation. Listen, EU and NATO has never worked as closely together as it has in the run-up and during the war in Ukraine. And that's basically a good thing. What we have been doing, I think, is uh, opening up, we have been uh, showing Russia unity, determination and solidarity and we, we have to keep this resolve between EU and NATO. Uh, I'm also very glad that we're of course also hosting Secretary General Stoltenberg tomorrow at our meeting and I think that's an indication of how deep EU and NATO are working these days. Now what you're of course seeing up in the north is a rally around the Euro-Atlantic institutions. Hopefully Sweden and Finland are on the trajectory to joining NATO. At the same time also Denmark is now fully engaged in the European security and defense policy. We think that's good and it's rational and it shows the complementarity and overlapping membership. You all know that Sweden has taken over the presidency of the EU at a crucial time for, for Europe and we're facing our most severe security environment since the end of the Second World War. Uh, we unfortunately need to prepare, be prepared for a long war. Russia's strategic objectives, though it hasn't been accomplished, they have not given up on the strategic objectives and we have to understand that we are in this for the long haul. Uh, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, a Russian victory in this war would have disastrous geostrategic, military and security policy consequences. So those are the stakes and that's why we have to provide with Ukraine the, as quick as possible and as much as possible support. Now just briefly touching on some of the priorities of the Swedish EU presidency, it's quite simple, it's three things that we focus on. Of course, when there's war in Europe, we focus on supporting Ukraine. That's on top of our agenda for everything that we're doing. Every meeting should also touch upon Ukraine. So support for Ukraine, a top priority for us. The other thing that we focus on is on partnership. We think the stars are standing right for deepening cooperation between EU and NATO. We're glad that the 
We now have the third joint declaration between EU and NATO that was adopted in January. We think it entails new avenues for cooperation between EU, such as on climate change, such as in emerging technologies and space. We think that's very helpful. Another aspect when we talk about Sweden and the approach to our EU cooperation is partnership. And I see uh, Sweeney here, uh, Carol Sweeney, very good. I'm very glad now that uh, the United States and the European Defense Agency are almost on um, able to close an administrative agreement between the EDA and the Uni United States. We think that's very good. We are, of course, very much open for deepening partnership between, between, the, United, between uh, the EU and Canada, between EU and Norway, between e uh, EU uh, and the United Kingdom, but also EU and Turkey. And we think that's important to build on as well. And we think it would be wise also to have individually tailored partnership to, to make the partnership much more effective. Last point uh, which the Swedish presidency focuses on as well is on the strategic compass that has provided the EU with a framework to work on security and defense matters, which I think is good. What is obvious with this war is that the EU has to become a stronger geopolitical actor. That's just a fact of life. We cannot take any strategic pause from other challenges that were exposed to as well, be it great power competition, being at the more aggressive and assertive China, being at the spread of the Wagner Group in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have to have the bandwidth of having, focusing now on Ukraine, but also handling other strategic challenges. I think that's really important. Now going back to the strategic, uh, um, strategic compass, you know it entails four different strands. I think what is really important with the strategic compass, that's making, being aware of the fact that history is changed by good decisions that are implemented. What we need to focus on when it comes to the strategic compass is implementation, implementation, implementation. That also goes back to us in, in the capital, so making sure that we can deliver on those four strands in the city compacts, it's act, it's in invest, it is partners, and it's um, it is um, secure. Uh, and I think one of the great benefits of the EU as a security provider, where it really provides added value, is in the nexus between internal and external security. There, it has effective tools when it comes to collective defense and the threat against military threats. I think the focus should be on NATO and Article Five. But I'll stop there, and we'll take the questions. Can you hear me now? <coughs> Excellent, sorry. <laughs> uh, we're ready for uh, the Q&A in just a, a second. And I, uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, give me a bit of a, a wave with your hand. But I will take the opportunity to ask the first question myself. And uh, very interesting uh, speeches, both of you. Um, I was uh, thinking also in terms of a little bit more practicalities. Uh, we also need uh, personnel to um, carry out a, a lot of this uh, work. And I know that in uh, your white paper from uh, 22, you're mentioning you're working to recruit, engage, and retain um, personnel to your defense organization. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, how you're working with that? And also, um, Paul, if you could talk a little bit about mm. the Swedish mm. um, personnel in, in terms of uh, how to mm. amp up that. Mm. Yes, well, thank you. It's a very important issue. And uh, we, of course, we are facing a very tight labor market in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we were expecting a bit of an uh, economic recession, but so far, luckily, uh, it hasn't turned out uh, that way. So the labor market is really uh, very tight. So one of the first things we did as a new government uh, last year was to uh, increase uh, the wages of, of all our military personnel. They were really behind, so it was also a necessary step. Uh, long, long awaited, uh, and that helps because now we are compatible with other, uh, uh, like the police force or, or other uh, fields of uh, uh, of interest. Um, uh, but secondly, also we have to keep the, the people that actually come. We have to keep them in, uh, so we have to adapt to to society and how society works. We need to have, uh, for instance, more women in. We have, uh, I think, we're at fourteen percent, so it's much, much too low. So we are working on that, and I think we are taking, uh, we are learning also from Sweden and Norway uh, on on your version of conscription, which is not called conscription. I know that, and we've started on a very small scale, doing trying to do the same thing, tr interesting uh, 17 and 18 year old 
uh, to do one year uh, in the military, have their military basic training, have one year of experience, uh, and some of them will stay, uh, and others will uh, not stay, but perhaps come back uh, later. Uh, and while when, when we scale that up, it will also be really useful for ourselves. So uh, in many ways, we are, we are changing uh, our policies, uh, adapting to the reality of, uh, of today, uh, and learning from other countries like Sweden. Mm. Well, uh, personally, it's one of the things that keeps me up at night. Uh, I think for three reasons. Of course, we are increasing our wartime organization, as we call it in Sweden, the from about 60,000 up to 100,000. We are have re-established five new regiments. That's a lot of families moving to different parts of Sweden, and we're going to be sending somewhere between 200 and 250 officers to NATO's command structure. So that's going to put pressure on uh, on the personnel. Now, uh, what do we do about it? I think the basic construction uh, for the personnel in Sweden is wise. I very much cherish that we do have military service and, and we do have standing forces and that we have a mixed system of it as well. So I think uh, the, the military service, of course, provide the possibilities for people to choose a life as an officer or as a, as a soldier or, or and so forth. So, so that's basically a sound system. Uh, then there's the whole issue also about the uh, quality of life and the conditions that they have. And I know, of course, our, our uh, shod has taken measures also to increase um, uh, some wages to some specific categories. And he said that he's going to continue uh, that dialogue and he's going to come back in 2024. I think those aspects are very, very important as well, that they have good conditions uh, uh, for, for the personnel. Thank you. We have a question from Matilda. You can Hi. introduce yourself. And yes, the for sure. <laughs> is this on? Yes. Now it's on. Okay. So uh, my name is Matilda Carlson, and I work for the Swedish uh, National Defense Industry Association. And uh, my primary focus is on the EU expansion on security. Uh, so I get all excited when you talk about acronyms such as the DIRPA and EDF. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, no, so you mentioned that, Kaisa, um, that, uh, I mean, there's a lot of discussions going on about common procurement and, yeah, a DIRPA, uh, such as. And I will see if the parliament is voting uh, in favor of that before the Swedish presiden presidency ends. But my question to you, or maybe if you could at least elaborate a little bit, I mean, because you mentioned that, but I would like to, I would like you to discuss on, I mean, is a DIRPA or is other initiatives on pro common procurement, is that a solution for the production capacity that we see in Europe, um, not only right now, but also in a long-term perspective. Thank you. Well, um, thank you. And uh, I'm really glad that someone likes the name of Idirpa. I don't really <laughs> have to The name is not so good, but uh, the purpose is very good, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's, a, it's a first step. Huh? It's not, I mean, we're talking 500 million. It's not a lot of money if you talk at the whole, uh, if you look at the whole market. But it's, a, it's, I think it's an important step. And I think it's also something that the EU is good at. Uh, uh, finding ways uh, to to promote joint procurement. So um, uh, the, it's not the only way, um, but we have to overcome something which is uh, our national reflex. Uh, and you, and Sweden also has a relatively large defense industry. So we in the Netherlands we have some industry, especially shipbuilding, we're very strong. Uh, radars, we, we're very strong, but for most of the, most of our defense, we have to cooperate with other with other countries, uh, and it's to uh, to us also being a medium-sized country, it comes natural to try to to join forces. We have a very strong cooperation with uh, Germany, uh, with the army, for instance, uh, and now that Germany is investing heavily. Uh, we also are looking at ways in doing joint procurement, uh, not only because of the joint procurement, not only of because of the economy of scale, because of the uh, interchangeability. When you work together, you also want to have the same capabilities and work with the same systems. So uh, we feel that's extremely important. So I think the IDIRPA and also ADA, which was already there, are, uh, are the right incentives uh, to help us overcome these national reflexes, but it's not going to be enough. Uh, and, and we really look to, uh, to other countries to also copy a little bit what we are trying to do. And I think also, for instance, with the Nordic countries, we're looking at the shipbuilding industry. We all have very uh, specific and strong shipbuilding industries. But if you look at the future, together we could be much stronger and be a global player. Uh, but then you have to overcome uh, also the reflexes in our national parliaments who are always looking at do we do enough for our own industry. Whereas if you look at the whole, they do enough for the European industry, it, we, we all profit from it. And we have a question from... 
My name is Carlos Neritnix, and my question is to Ms. Alan Grimm. Now your defense budget is increasing quite drastically, and you will reach 2% quite soon. Which areas will be, let's call it, the most important ones where you will invest the money? More frigates, more F-35s, or what? Yeah, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, uh, I think, in part, we are we're seeing an increase of 40% of our budget. So it's really a big step, and we try to do it also very quickly. Uh, so first, it's uh, personnel. So it's people. We have to invest in people. Uh, second is, uh, we have to do some repair. Because we have been cutting the budget for such a long time. Uh, we have been squeezing uh, our armed forces uh, too much. So you know, just to have the, the, the basics right costs money. Uh, so we have to repair that. It's not very sexy, but we have to do it. Uh, and then the third thing is you have to invest in, uh, really in, in what is sustainable also for the future. Uh, and there, of course, there are always differences uh, of opinion. And we had a very big debate about that when, when we started, when my government had to present the first budget and the plans for, for, for the future. Uh, and I think we have tried also to make the choices, you know, there are some areas in which we are good. We simply, we don't have to be modest about it. We know that we are uh, strong in, for instance, in our Air Force with the F-35s. We are investing now in more F-35s. Uh, we are also increasing, uh, we are also investing in, in Reapers, which are unmanned uh, airplanes, especially for reconnaissance. And we're also looking into the possibility to arm them. Uh, now, uh, we are going to invest in deep precision strike, which we have not done uh, before, but we feel that is something we, we could have added value for NATO. It's not one of our capability targets, but we know that is an area where we uh, have added value also for, for others. So, and now I only mentioned Air Force, but we have done the same also for the Navy and looked also uh, at the Army. And of course also, uh, we, we should think about cyber, we have to consider space. But these are areas where I think that we have to do more jointly. Space, you have to invest huge amounts of money in space. Uh, we have to be aware of the fact that, uh, well, America is number one, but China has become number two, it's not Europe anymore. Uh, if we want to do something about it, we have to join forces. We have to work with countries like Sweden, Norway, France, who are really good in this. Uh, but we have to be prepared to put the money where our mouth is. So these are the type of choices that we have been trying uh, to make. And that exactly uh, as, as was said, uh, we, are, we are implementing now. Because it's all also in this case about implementation. And over here, question. Jens Pettersson. When scrutinizing last year's Dutch white paper on defense, uh, the overall theme was, of course, cooperation. But you can also see there a distinction in between integration and specialization. You're integrating your mechanized army entirely, lock, stock and barrel, with Germany. You are integrating your navy in the North Sea, uh, mine countermeasure, entirely with Belgium. So my question to you both is, should the two kingdoms cooperate by complementarity and specializing to each other, or should the two kingdoms integrate? And of course, we have princesses and princesses which can accomplish this. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, th th that's a big question, Jens. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me just say, uh, I mean, the normal format of we work on this in Nordefco, and uh, I mean, here is the fathers we come on defense cooperation, and I notice a much bigger interest now from the Norwegians and the Danes when we're joining the alliance. Basically, of course, we're going to have the same kind of security architecture in war crisis uh, and, and, and in peace, so that helps out, but most of all because we're going to have common defense planning, and that's going to open up uh, new avenues for us to cooperate. And I think, uh, but that doesn't necessarily entail only you know, the Nordic, Nordic Baltics. I think that's 
many things we can do in the Netherlands. We do a lot of things, not at least when it comes to the maritime issues also within the Joint Expeditionary Force. And I think that's something that uh, we will strive for. We will strive for strategic partnerships, uh, uh, be it uh, in, in the aerial or, uh, you know, you're operating the CV-90s as well. If we can do something on, on CV-90s and Ukraine underwater surface competence, I think uh, shipbuilding traditions and naval traditions is something that brings us to, together. But uh, as a vague answer, <laughs> I realized that I have to go. But, uh, but I uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll see you tonight. Yeah, sure, guys, I <laughs> all right, see you. Bye bye. <laughs>I think one one idea that I was that was picked up was the kind of the overarching role of of European security and defense policy and you both pointed out that you saw kind of added value in in a new sense uh, on on the EU side and I think that's true I mean the the area of security and defense policy was essentially not a defense policy but a crisis management policy for for almost two decades and uh, and it is now transferring into something different I would say it's still not entirely clear what the, the long-term goal of European security and defense policy, but right now it works really good. There's, there's definitely, I think no one can, 
can say anything else that the EU and NATO has complemented each other really well in, in relation to Ukraine. And also, to be fair, no one really wants to do crisis management anymore, so there's not a lot of overlap in, in that sense. <coughs> so in the short term, uh, there, I would say there's really harmony between these efforts. But I think something that Minister Ollengren uh, took up, which I think is really fundamental here, is that time is of the essence, and you didn't only mean it in the short term, but also the long term. And here I'm, I'm slightly more, uh, not pessimistic, but, but wondering what, what really is the role of, of European security defense in the long term and how can we shape incentives? Because you said something interesting that we are exporting our industrial fragmentation to Ukraine, but the day after we are still importing even more fragmentation. And that might be very wise in the short term by, by investing in, in Korean tanks or Israeli systems or, or or US systems, but essentially we are increasing the level of fragmentation, which might hollow out our own industrial capacity, which might come in handy in, say, 10 years if we need to face Russia again in a decade or something like that. And I think that the, the kind of trade-offs between the short term and long term is something we really need to, to grapple with. Um, second question is, is uh, national interest that kind of stand out and has uh, traditionally between these countries. We are similar. Uh, a few years ago I wrote a report on, on Sweden and the CSDP with the title Interest in Search of a Strategy and I think to some extent that is still true. We have some very strong and often industrial and historical interests but we would have difficulties in transferring these into a coherent strategy. Hopefully we won't have the same difficulties when it comes to, to NATO. But Sweden has been pretty hesitant to many of the initiatives since say 2016 leading up to what we actually have today. Um, so I was um, happy that uh, Paul Jonsson early on uh, said that he wants to be more kind of forward-leaning or Sweden to be more forward-leaning. He now claimed that we should be at the very heart at, uh, at European security and defense. And I think that sounds excellent, uh, but we also need to consider where we are politically. We saw that Sweden was one of the most critical countries when it comes to EDIRPA, again, this acronym. Uh, all the parties signal the issues with that. And I think this is a risk that, that we have, that we are essentially, we, we risk becoming a kind of a, a two-issue uh, country that cares about third-party access to, to defense uh, cooperation in uh, that is essentially U.S. access to, to European funds and, and cooperation. We saw it in PESCO, EDF, we're probably going to see it in EDIRPA and whatever comes after the EDIRPA. This is one of Sweden's eternal battles. And the other is subsidiarity, which have, of course, ties into our resistance to supranational integration. Uh, but these are interests. It's not a strategy. And I think that is something to, to really work on. Finally, just, just my last minute, I think not to make this kind of the same mistake again when we enter NATO, hopefully quite soon, is to really have a strategy. And one strategy, of course, can be based on where we are, and perhaps Anna will say something about that, our responsibility in our geography. But I think we should also have a strategy based on what we are, and in, in this case, uh, a high-tech nation. And I think our tech contribution and innovation contribution could be really important when we join NATO, and this is something we really should look strategically at. And it also includes partners, and I think here we have excellent opportunity for cooperation also with the Netherlands when it comes to defense innovation and a and, uh, common industrial base. So I'll stop there, but thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to ask you, Bjorn, before you um, have a seat again. Um, the last year we've seen um, the US withdrawing from parts of uh, the international involvement that they've been uh, engaged in before. How does this affect the EU and what demands does that put on the EU as a collective and a global actor within defense policy? Well, I mean, I in relation to Ukraine, I would argue that the US is actually more present than, than for a long time in, in Europe and also politically under Biden administration. But I think we should, we should make sure to use this could be rather unique and perhaps short uh, term in, in history to actually make something constructive out of it. Like how do we how do we use this this episode of of some very constructive relations with with the benign like U.S. administration to prepare for times when we will need to take more responsibility for our own security? We heard that's a common goal. Well, well, again, then we need to t think in the long term. And I think this actually is a this is a bit of a conflicting interest here from a U.S. perspective. On the one hand, they they love to to sell their kit and and they want to be involved in whatever we do. 
uh, when it comes to development of our defense. On the other hand, they are extremely interested in Europe as a more capable ally and actually that we have uh, a strong industrial base. And uh, that's something that the U.S. needs to kind of agree what is most important, to have a very credible and capable ally or to, to sell that extra stuff to us. Uh, but it's also, a, most of all, it's a decision for, for Europeans. If we want to be able to act together, we need to invest together. That's the end of the day. Thank you so much. I will now invite uh, Anna Wislander as well to the stage to share your reflections with us. <coughs> Just something a bit. You can sit down. <coughs> so, thank you so much. Is it working, this one? Yes, for you at least. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, and uh, Minister Ollongren, nice to meet you again, and uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, who left. Um, I don't want to crash the party, but I thought I would give some remarks on um, EU defense policy and what I think we need ahead, because I think this past year, uh, the EU kind of landed on its feet a bit uh, into reality. Uh, you mentioned the added value, and I think that's a little bit how we all see it now and to be constructive in that part. Um, and in order to move forward, uh, I have three short gaps that I thought I'll just touch upon and what I think uh, we should move forward on uh, in addressing those. Uh, the first gap is between the transatlantic and the European. And we have come some way there. We have addressed uh, third party access to various EU uh, projects, which is good. Uh, it's necessary, but I don't think it's, it's sufficient. Uh, in a way, it's a, a bigger philosophical question uh, when I listen to the debate in Europe. Uh, some countries believe that we are generally believe that we are too dependent on the US in a way also of the shadow of the future, what will happen in the US um, 2024 and, and after that, what we saw uh, with the previous administration. And then there are other countries in Europe that are concerned that they, are not, uh, that they cannot keep the dependency from the US, investing in, in procurement on the shelf and so on, just to m maintain the US support. And these are two yet genuine cons lines of concerns that we need to bridge. Um, and often this can cause a lot of friction, to be honest. Uh, but I think the, m the way ahead there, just very briefly, is to talk more about European responsibility uh, the word responsibility, I really think, ca carries a, a good connotation in this regard. Uh, and to also work more on the European pillar in, in NATO, because when it comes down, even the French uh, are members of NATO. Uh, but you want more of the European uh, uh, capabilities, the European will to act. Uh, and that does not only... Uh, include the EU, it also includes the UK, uh, Norway, even Turkey, other important actors on this continent that are close to the conflicts that we want to, to handle. We need to get that in, but still keep the transatlantic framework. Uh, my second point is the, the gap between the big countries and the small countries in Europe. Sometimes we are not explicit enough about that. Um, it has to do with the markets. Uh, Sweden is, for instance, Netherlands too, you ha we have our own uh, defense industrial uh, base, but then you also have the very big actors, France, Germany. I was just looking at this chart from, from SOF, um, share of national procurement related to the total budget, national procurement related to the total budget, France 99%, Germany 96%. That leaves a market of 1% in France open for others, 4% in Germany opens to others. Sweden has 70%. So, you know, this is also what we are talking about when we're talking about the fragmentation, the cooperation. Uh, we need to get, uh, I mean, just cooperation does not bring efficiency or lower the costs. Uh, we need to have competition within these markets as well. And, and I think we have not addressed that issue uh, enough. Uh, there is great potential to move, to move forward there, uh, perhaps at the target of how big a share of uh, the national procurement related to total budget should be national. Uh, you can set a target and you can work towards that. Is it, you know, 75%? Is it 70% or...? 
I think it should not be 99%. Mm. <laughs> uh, and then my third um, point, uh, very briefly, uh, and uh, Minister Ollengren also touched upon this a lot, the, the relationship between the capitals and the EU institutions. And I think there has been a, a, really a reality check where, where uh, the EU now works a lot more as um, uh, perhaps bringing the incentives, bringing people together, but not being the full answer to everything. Because we have to also realize if we are European, I mean, I in the capitals, that's where the big national budgets are. That's where the defense companies are still national. They are connected closely to national governments. Uh, and that's also where the decision making is. So we can have EU projects, initiatives, but also, very importantly, national projects where we cooperate over, over borders. Uh, you mentioned the Northern Naval Shipbuilding Corporation, we have the European Sky Shield Initiative, all these other kind, these kinds of smart defense initiatives uh, are really, really important. And they should count as well, I think, when we talk about increasing the European capacity. So those were my very short remarks. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. I will now uh, invite both of you to the stage uh, oh, for a right. short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and again, if you have uh, a question, please uh, raise your hand and I will have my colleague uh, come around with the microphone. Uh, but um, I wanted to, again, start with uh, a question of my own. Um, a little bit on, again, the, the contributions that we've made to, to Ukraine, both Sweden and Ukraine. Um, how do you see that moving forward? Um, how much more can we give and what type of support? Um, are we looking at? Well, uh, just to start, I think, I mean, we have S Sweden, Netherlands, we have uh, really um, come a long way in this past year. Uh, I think what we need to do uh, moving forward uh, is to have a sustainable strategy f for this, looking at how can we keep this going if we have to, uh, both to support Ukraine and to, to uh, fill up our own stocks and even increase our own uh, capabilities. And that puzzle is, is th all, all those th three thi things hang, hang together. Uh, but I think that I don't think it's fair towards Ukraine a little bit what we have been doing from the European side is, is to say that, I mean, if you look at national defense, if we compare to defending Sweden, and we would say, go out there, defend against a bigger adversary, but you cannot use your air force and you cannot use the long range missiles, but you should go there anyway and we are behind you. I, you know, I think we need to understand that if we want them to take the fight, they need all the things uh, available. And I think we are getting there and I think that's, that's where we will be the next level. Uh, yeah, just to add, I think fr from a Swedish perspective right now, I think, uh, I mean, if we see this from a presidency perspective, I think the, the task of preserving unity uh, within the EU is, is our most important task um, when it comes to sanctions and, and policies going forward. But then I agree on, on the military perspective. Uh, there's more to be done and I, I'm sure we will do more. Uh, but I. I think this logic is going to prevail. That is going to be a very kind of incremental step by step increase of support, unfortunately, to match the kind of suffering I in Ukraine. Uh, I, I don't really see the, the West uh, doing some kind of big bang and, uh, and letting go of all hesitations and going all in of some sort. Uh, can't really see that happening. Uh, but I agree that it's, it's a pretty painful process to be, to be part of this kind of incremental uh, support. Then just to mention one thing that I think Sweden is already doing but, but should perhaps do even more of is planning for the reconstruction. I mean there's going to be enormous needs of, of support. And most likely not, not after the war, but it, it's not unlikely that much of this reconstruction will have to start already when there are warlike conditions uh, in Ukraine. And I think that's something to prepare for as a society, but also from private interests. Mm. And I also wanted to ask you a little bit, Anna, you were looking ahead a little bit on, on the future and, and so, but also one other thing I wanted to ask is when the war ends, and I'm not saying if, but when it ends, um, how will this affect the EU defense policy? Are we then scaling down or do you see that kind of being maintained or where are we going when the war ends? I think this is a very important point because it's, it's not like, well, in one year there will be peace in Ukraine and we can all 
go back to, to think about other things. The investments we do now, the capabilities we invest in, the production rate and all of that, it needs to be sustained. This, these are long-term investments. Um, we're talking about decade here of defense spending at 2% at the least, I think, 3%. And then you need the training of the personnel, you need the maintenance, you need to have... Um, it's a completely different mindset. And I don't think we will ever come back to where we were. This is, a, this is a transformative war in very many ways, and it will be for the EU defense policy as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's clearly, I mean, hopefully the war will end, but our country, most likely we will live in some form of unpeace. We'll have to, to adopt our institutions for a pretty long future with, with a very fraught relationship with, with Russia or to Russia or against Russia. Uh, so definitely a long-term perspective. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is something that will affect both the EU and NATO. I think one thing that, is, that w definitely will make a, a change is if we talk about enlargement. Uh, Ukraine has to, I mean, they have some kind of idea of them joining NATO since 2008, and now a, a process towards joining the EU. Uh, the, the schedules of these processes will, will also have an impact on the organizations, but if... If, uh, if Ukraine eventually will join the European Union before they, they will be NATO members, uh, then that will have, that will have a, a pretty large impact on the EU as a security provider and, and, and uh, Article 42.7 will come in a different light, etc. Uh, if, if they would eventually become members of NATO before they become members of the EU, they will have less change uh, on, on the EU side. But that will have a, a big impact on the organization. Thank you. And uh, that concludes our seminar today. Um, thank you to Kaisa Ollongren, Paul Jonsson, Anna Wislander and Björn Fegestin for your contributions. It was great having you here. Um, and thank you all for coming today and for uh, those of you who are watching online. For more information on our upcoming activities um, or if you want to listen to our podcast, please go to uh, folkhochforsvar.se or follow us in social media channels. And thank you and hope to see you again. Thank you.